Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. To all of our guests who are here in person, we're very thrilled to hear all of the bubbling of conversations that are happening. Was also very pleased to have all of our guests who are joining us virtually this evening as well on this gloomy yet hopeful Ottawa evening. Uh, and just to get started, I would like to welcome uh, Khalil Sharif, who is the CEO of Aga Khan Foundation Canada, to come off and give us some uh, opening remarks. Khalil. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Uju. Uh, good evening, uh, and welcome to uh, tonight's uh, most recent episode of Global Reads, which is Aga Khan Foundation Canada's global book club. Um, my name is Khalil Sharif. I'm the CEO of the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. It's a delight and a great privilege to welcome you here to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamate, uh, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. And uh, this land uh, is a very important uh, part of um, the history of this country um, and of the people who inhabited it for many thousands of years before it was a country. Because here in Ottawa, uh, just here where the three rivers meet, was a place that for millennia, the indigenous people gathered from a very large uh, catchment area. And the Algonquin were known to be people of great hospitality because every season they would welcome uh, indigenous people of, um, of great diversity from this catchment area for periods of um, exchange, exchange of goods and services for sure, but also of relationship and of ideas. And so it is in that great tradition, that long tradition of indigenous hospitality and of exchange that we gather here today at the delegation, also in the spirit of exchange, of relationships and of ideas. Uh, Aga Khan Foundation Canada is part of a global network of institutions known as the Aga Khan Development Network, which are uh, a series of institutions dedicated to promoting quality of life, uh, especially in some of the most poor and difficult parts of the world. And we have learned after uh, many years of this work that one of the things that we try to instill in both ourselves and the people with whom we work is this idea of global citizenship, that we are part of a great global community uh, and a shared humanity. We've understood that that sense of solidarity with people around the world and in very different contexts is elemental to the idea of people coming together to support improvements of quality of life for people maybe they will never see, um, uh, who may live very far away and in different contexts, but to whom we are bound inextricably. And there are many ways we do this, but one of the ways we've been doing this is through this book club and why I'm so excited about this particular um, uh, evening. We look for works um, uh, of uh, fiction and nonfiction, although I'm very happy to say that the works of fiction have been heroic contributors to our discussions here, uh, that help us develop a sense of consciousness about what is happening in the world. And uh, we have had um, uh, a whole series of books, um, most recently uh, Omar El Akkad's beautiful uh, What Strange Paradise, which is a real reflection and meditation on the global migration crisis. We had Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, uh, where he talked about his own thinking about what the future might hold if we were actually able to bumble through and tackle climate change in some serious way as a global community. Um, so uh, it has been an extraordinary journey. Tonight, we have a literary form that we have yet to encounter, which is the short story. And um, we have in this beautiful, beautiful collection of short stories, not in the ornamental teapot, um, a work uh, that is um, a very careful uh, reflection on the situation of people in a particular place in the world, Cyprus, that actually has exhibited so many universal themes of our current global condition. And the characters in this novel, or in this collection, are very, very strong. I, for one, uh, will be forever struck by this elderly woman, Anna, who in the second short story is sitting at a home alone in a city that's been deserted because everyone has fled and she refuses to flee. 
And it is the story, this little episode in the life of a woman whose memory and whose hopes collide in this one moment as she sits alone in this deserted city. Um, so the scenes in this book are beautiful, they're deep, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, Irata uh, Io Anu has agreed to join us to help uh, share some of this. Um, our model at AKFC Global Reads is that we find an, a distinguished member of uh, Canada's international affairs community to lead the discussion in the book. And today I'm overjoyed that I think maybe for the first time on this stage, is that true? Um, my uh, colleague Meredith Preston McGee, who is um, the Secretary General of the Global Center for Pluralism, um, which is uh, an international institution dedicated to the idea uh, that diversity is one of our great assets as uh, humanity, has agreed to take on the task of uh, um, navigating this discussion. This event has been a collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, High Commission uh, of Cyprus to Canada, and I want to thank the High Commissioner and his team for bringing this opportunity to us um, and uh, for making it available. Um, we've got extraordinary representation from um, Ottawa's Diplomatic Corps. I want to welcome all of you here and thank you for being with us. This entire series is a collaboration with Global Affairs Canada, uh, to whom I'm also very, very grateful. So um, I will uh, uh, leave my introduction there, leave you, I hope, excited about what you're going to be hearing, and uh, hopefully excite you all in the process of uh, exploring the ideas uh, in the book. Um, I am now going to invite um, uh, a very special guest we have tonight with us, Efares Kustala, who is the president of the Parnassus Hellenic Cultural Society of Ottawa, who said to me that she's read the book in English and she's now got it in Greek. So uh, she is looking for, she liked it so much, she's reading it twice. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, President Costala to the stage to offer some welcome before we get going. President. Okay, thank you, Khalil. Uh, and thank you to the um, High Commissioner of Cyprus, Mr. Uh, Yorgos Ioannidis, who invited me to introduce Arato Ioannou's book, Not in the Ornamental Teapot. So the four fictional stories in the book, as Khalil said, they all take place in Cyprus and all have female protagonists. The third first stories refer to events during and after the Turkish invasion of 1974, while the fourth one happens much earlier. So I will give you, a fir at first, a very brief historical background. So Cyprus had a long period of Ottoman occupation from the 16th century to early 20th century. In, 18 in 1878, Cyprus was transferred from Turkish to British rule and eventually became a British colony. Throughout its history, Cyprus had kept its predominantly Greek character and from the 19th century onwards, the majority of the Greek Cypriot population pursued enosis, which means union, with Greece. During the years of British colonial rule, the popular sentiment for enosis, together with the resentment of uh, British tax policies and repressive measures, led to several periods um, of conflict, uprisings, and, and general political instability. Finally, in 1960, Britain granted Cyprus its independence. On July 15, 19, 1974, the military regime in Greece, the junta, orchestrated a coup d'etat in Cyprus, aiming at united Cyprus with Greece. Uh, and five days later, on July 20th, Turkey invaded northern Cyprus, and it still occupies 37% of the island. The two first stories take place in Amohostos, also known as Famagusta, a very important Mediterranean port and prominent city at the north side of Cyprus. So story one, uh, called Something Tiny, is told through the mouth of a granddaughter talking about her yaya, her grandmother, who refuses to accept that her husband was killed. She refuses to be among the black clad women who after the invasion took to the streets holding photographs of their missing husbands, brothers, and sons. She professed to believe that he has deserted her while she was pregnant and he lives in America. It, it is her coping mechanism and her way to protect her daughter, who, 
who never knew her father, and to protect her from that gruesome truth. She rather hate a cheating husband who is alive and well, leading a life of sprinkle with sprinkles, than mourn a dead one. As the author says, only hate could be stronger than pain. Only hate could fill the horrendous void of vanishing into thin air. In the second story, called Deserted, as um, Khalil uh, mentioned, Anna, an old grandmother who lived all her life in Famagusta, close to the Varosi Resort, refuses to leave after the invasion and stays behind alone despite her health problems. She'd rather die alone than become another refugee and die away in some other place. The title Deserted, to me, applies both to Anna and the town of Famagusta. And just a brief historic background of Famagusta. Famagusta was bombed by Turkish aircrafts and the entire Greek Cypriot population fled into surrounding areas. Unlike other parts of the Turkish-controlled area of Cyprus, Varosi was fenced off by the Turkish army and remained fenced, fenced off until 2020. Still today, decaying buildings and rubble line the streets of the abandoned district. It, it's a ghost town. In a way, Anna becomes a ghost like Varosi. There is a scene where Anna, in her mind, transforms back to her young, strong self. And I quote, she now runs through the streets of the deserted city, the wind brushing the sides of her body. She flung herself over abandoned cars and trash cans, her brand new youthful body defying the laws of gravity. Perched onto the roofs of the tall buildings, she watched the Land Rover as it cruised leisurely down the road." End of quotation. The third story, Saving Jesus and the Apostles, take place in Nicosia, the capital of Cyprus, several years after the invasion, and portrays two women, Rodula, an old religious woman who owns a cafe neo, a coffee place, and the other is Susanna, a young foreign prostitute. Rodula is appalled by the presence of the prostitute in her neighborhood. An embroidered icon depicting the Last Supper that hangs in Susanna's house was a thorn in Rodula's side, as the author says. In the story, old Rodula tries to come to terms with the changes in her hometown with the influx of foreign immigrants and deal with her own prejudices and preconceptions. The protagonists of the first three stories are older women who have suffered through their lives, have dedicated themselves to their families, and had neglected their physical appearance. As Rodula is described in the third story, she would carry her weight with difficulty, waddling like an enormous duck, whizzing like an asthmatic, the fat in her arms and hips quaking to the rhythm of her steps. Generally, older, worn-out women are invisible in our society. We do not pay much attention to them. Erato Ioannou not only gives a voice to them, but, but makes the characters memorable and the reader sympathizes with their plights. The fourth story called Eye of the Goat is a coming of age story about a poor village girl who is sent by her mother to live in the city pretending to be a boy in order to have better op opportunities in life. As her mother tells her, and I quote, this is a world of men. A woman is born to be owned, first by her father, then by her husband, and always by God. She is born with no money and goes through life with no money. She is born ignorant and dies with whatever wisdom she is allowed by those who rule her. The story is narrated in the first person by the girl who tries to fit the mold of a macho young man lots of times unsuccessfully. At the same time, she's trying to understand, she's a teenager, she's trying to understand the female nature as an outsider since she must not reveal who she really is. So looking at the eye of the goat, she's expected to kill, she sees, and I quote, those lidless eyes with a peculiar pupil, a straight line, running horizontally across the eyeball. And then she says, all I could think was that with such eyes, they could see the word flat, and flat, flat as they saw it, it must have been less complicated. All four protagonists are strong-minded and resilient. And as uh, Panos Ioannidis, who wrote the prologue um, on, in the English book, writes, 
They deal with extreme situations and they resort to extreme actions. I personally found, and I'm not sure if the author agrees, that all the stories have an ending that shows that the tension which tormented the four protagonists is released, figuratively or metaphorically. There is the feeling of just let it go. All stories have a strong erotic element. They are powerful, moving stories that stay with you. To me, it seems that I have met those women in person. It is amazing how many vivid images the author packs into so few pages. Thank you to Ereto Ioannou for that excellent book, and I encourage you all to read it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faris, for giving us that very detailed and lovely presentation, as well as an account uh, on the book and you know the personal stories that you shared. Um, before we move on to the next segment, uh, we would like to give everyone who is participating, both online and in person, an opportunity to just delve further into the topics and the themes that we have uh, planned for today's discussion. So uh, in a moment, we should have a Slido code that, it will, be, that will be coming up on our screen. So for those who are joining um, from a different device, uh, you can please pull out, pull out your mobile devices and you can scan the QR code. And even for our guest in person, we're encouraging everyone to sort of getting um, uh, and I'll, I'll give us some time to sort of just, you know, maneuver and, and get our phones out or whatever other device that we want to use. So if you could just pull that up and scan the QR code and also to our guests who are joining in person, um, you can scan the QR code or just go to slido.com and put the, the, the meeting code into your device. And we'll just give everyone a few, a few minutes to sort of just join in, make sure that they have the code right, that they're in, and then once I give the team a go ahead and we can get started momentarily. Okay, so I think we should be able to get started now with the first question. So we're just asking everyone, um, just let us know where you're joining us from, if you're in person, uh, what region or territory that you're joining us from, um, just let us know so we can see where all of our guests are coming in from um, Portugal. I see someone putting in Portugal. So thank you so much for joining us all the way from Portugal. Um, Cyprus. I'm seeing BC. The Solomon Islands. In person, Slovenia. Montreal, thank you so much to everyone who is joining from different parts. I know a lot of people are also joining from Ottawa, so we appreciate all of our Ottawa guests for also coming in, and also to all of our guests who are here in person as well. Okay, uh, we can move um, on to the next question. So, we know that hearing from a diversity of voices is critical within literature. So, we're now asking you, which voices do you feel are underrepresented in literature today? So if you've been paying attention or if you've had the chance to read the book that we're featuring today as well, you should be able to have a very quick and easy answer <laughs> to that question. But we also would like to get your perspective of other people or voices that you feel are also underrepresented in literature today. So I see a lot of neurodiverse authors, African, sorry, not authors, um, African voices, women of color, refugees, Muslim, older adults, people with disabilities, um, many voices. <laughs> I see that as well, which is also very true. Um, voices from different nations and regions as well. Um, linguistic minority. So thank you everyone. Um, hopefully to our author in the room or our other authors, <laughs> um, we're giving you a head start on your next book or on your next piece of work um, through, through these responses. So we can move on to the next question. 
In conflict settings, which segment of society is often left behind in the narrative from your perspective? In conflict settings, which segment of society is often left behind in the narrative? So I see a, a big emphasis on women, on children, on minorities, children of young age, older women, girls, the elderly, disabled per persons, people who are ill, um, seniors. I'm trying to read them as I can see to the best of my vision. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we there's a there's a there's a good variety of uh, a good range I should say of voices that we all feel um, are often left behind in the narrative, and I think it's a good thing that we're gathered here this evening, focusing on the book that we're focusing on, just reminding ourselves of the importance of resurfacing these voices, these perspectives into literature, into our day-to-day -day practices, into our work, um, because definitely. There is strength in diversity and strength in numbers and strength in various perspectives that we can get. And we can transition on to the next question. So we have, in global development, what more needs to be done to ensure the voices and perspectives of women are an integral part of decision-making processes? So this one is a bit more uh, complex. There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> We're just hoping to um, get your perspective on what exactly you feel would help to elevate and amplify um, the voices and perspectives of women as it pertains to global development. So I'm seeing women as women in positions of power, women as decision makers, leadership, an emphasis on education as well, uh, and an emphasis on power sharing, funding, having compassion, less judgment, open-mindedness, so a whole slew of, of responses that we're getting in um, this evening. So we can move on to the next question. So the voices of strong and bold older women are prominent in today's uh, book that we're focusing on, not in the ornamental teapot. So we'd like to ask you, who is one strong woman who has been instrumental in your life? It could be someone personal. It could be a non-personal um, person that you, have, uh, that, you have, that you have encountered. A lot of moms, mothers are coming through <laughs> with the responses. Uh, even mother-in-laws, teachers, um, I love to see that. Um, and then specific names as well that are coming through. Uh, Toni Morrison, a spouse, grandmas. So yeah, so we definitely see that from our experiences, there are definitely some strong women who have helped shape our experiences and shape our upbringing or shape our career trajectory um, to this date. So we'll move on to the last question. So what are you most looking forward to from today's discussion? Maybe we can give our speakers a little bit of insights <laughs> before the conversation starts. What are you most looking forward to from today's discussion? Um, learning something new. You're maybe hearing all perspectives. Maybe you're looking to get surprised to get challenged, a lively conversation, happiness, I love that as well, the author's perspective, wisdom, hearing Erato, yes, inspiration. I hope you are looking to hear the author speak. Yeah, so we hope that from today's conversation, you're able to at least have your expectations met or even maybe something else that you can encounter from today's conversation that you weren't already thinking about. So thank you everyone for participating in our little quiz. Thank you to everyone uh, in person and also online for taking the time 
to join this mini conversation before we move on to the meat of our gathering this evening. So I would like to welcome uh, Meredith Preston McGee, who was the Secretary General of the Global Center for Pluralism. She previously served as the Africa Regional Director with the HD Center, including as an advisor to Kofi Annan during the Kenya National Dialogue and Reconciliation. Through more than 20 years in Africa, she helped to establish and facilitate peace processes in Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, and South Sudan. She began her career working with the Naga in Northeast India and indigenous communities in Myanmar. So please give a warm welcome to Meredith Preston McGee. And I would also like to introduce Erato Ioannou, who is uh, our very esteemed author for today's discussion. Inspired by her life in Nicosia, which is the last divided city in Europe, Erato is the author of short story collections, Cats Have It All, and Not in the Ornamental Teapot, which is now published in Greek, English, and Spanish. Her work received praise and featured international journals and anthologies. Her short story, Deserted, which is included in her most recent collection, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2019, out of approximately 5,000 entries. Most recently, her novel, Muerta, was the winner in the historical fiction category for the Stockholm Writers' First Five Pages Prize out of approximately 800 entries. She served as the, as the editor-in-chief of the literary magazine of the Cypriot Pen in Focus from 2016 to 2020, and she is the founder and chair of Room for Art. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Erato. So I guess it's over to me. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And Arato, welcome. And this is just such a pleasure to get to have this conversation uh, oh my God, with you. So many people. This is so overwhelming. I know, but it's yeah. like it's like yesterday. So Arato and I had a conversation um, yesterday, and we we're actually really disappointed that we didn't just record it because then we could sit back and have a glass of wine and just play <laughs> our conversation from yesterday. We covered um, a huge amount of ground, and you know, um, thank you so much for what a beautiful introduction to um, to the to the stories for anyone who hasn't had a chance already to read this beautiful work I was thinking about the power of short stories and I think I said to you yesterday every story at the end I was sort of like oh no no it shouldn't be over just yet and I was thinking about the power of brevity and how carefully you've used the words. And there's a very famous, many of you will hear, have heard this um, exercise about telling a story in six words. Oh. And Ernest Hemingway has told one of the most sort of famous six word stories, baby, which is Baby shoes for sale, never, never worn. worn. Which I've been thinking a lot about after reading your pieces because it is that it says so much and so much is left unsaid, but it draws you in so deeply. And so again, I mean, we're just thrilled to be talking to you about this. Um, as you've heard, I spent a lot of time on peace and conflict issues. And so the, the experiences of women in conflict as well is just is so fascinating. But I wanted to start with a question of language, if I may because this is your first work in English. And the act of writing in a language that is not your first language and the choice of English for these stories was really interesting to me. And we talked a bit about this yeah. yesterday. So I wanted to maybe ask you to start to talk a little bit about those decisions and that process. Thank you, thank you, Meredith. Uh, everyone, I will just pretend that you are not here, but thank you for <laughs> being here. Um, <clears throat> okay, actually, no, this is not the first work written in English. I, I started uh, writing uh, in English, and there is a story behind that, because I received um, my education in Greek, 
And uh, I don't think there is another literature in the world that has language itself as a theme um, in poems, short stories, uh, essays. And uh, I was raised with uh, the literature of the greatest male uh, Greek godlike authors and poets. So I was too afraid to write in my mother tongue. Uh, when I finished high school, I studied English language and literature. I studied the literatures of the world. Um, then I went to the US, so the other half of my education was in English. So I felt more comfortable mm -hmm. in my second language. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes academics will over-intellectualize language, but that's their job. For me, language is a tool. Mm -hmm. If it carries the meaning, mm -hmm. then I got away with it. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm interested in the fact that um, in how you then um, transitioned these stories back into Greek, because you said, I'm gonna quote you back from yesterday, because I thought you put this unsurprisingly beautiful. You said, each language is a universe in which the character exists. And so just if you could also say something about then putting it back into Greek, because you, you rewrote it into Greek, yes. is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we got this collection published in, in English, um, I felt that, I felt the need to bring my women back home. Mm -hmm. And uh, home meant their language. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to translate the short stories. Uh, I ended up not translating, but rewriting the whole mm -hmm. thing because every single word is haunted mm -hmm. um, by language. Mm -hmm. So you have to be there 100% within that universe mm -hmm. in order to achieve yeah. you know, the character. Um, make it believable, mm -hmm. uh, the character, the narrative, the fantastic world that you're mm -hmm. trying to build, because you have to convince, you have to convince. And every word has to carry so much when you're in a short story. Uh, especially in the short story, such a beautiful, challenging mm -hmm. form, uh, so condensed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a small window, a mm -hmm. very, very small window with a grand view. Yeah. So. And um, when Uju had us do this, um, this quiz, which I hope you all enjoyed, um, one of the, the things that came out was perspectives that are, that are missing in conflict. And of course, many people answered around, around women. And so, you know, I think the, the approach that you've taken to really sh open a window to the experiences of the conflict in Cyprus through the eyes of women brings a level of nuance and humanity to those, to those spaces. So I'm curious about the diversity of these women and these stories. How did these women and these stories come together into this collection? What brought you to bring these four stories together? They were written uh, during different times under mm -hmm. different circumstances, uh, published uh, in journals, anthologies. Um, two of the stories were, were also dis uh, distinguished in competitions of the Commonwealth. Um, and uh, they somehow told me that they have to come together mm -hmm. in one book mm -hmm. and continue mm -hmm. their journey together. Mm -hmm. And this is how the collection was uh, created. So it was their choice in a way, not yes. yours? Yes, yes, like definitely. Like and this focus on older women, which I know was, was mentioned as well, was that um, a conscious choice when you, were, when you were sort of imagining these stories, that you were telling the stories of older women? Well, since we are confessing things. <laughs> um, writing and creation comes from within. Mm -hmm. And uh, I write because I, I, I want to understand things about myself mm -hmm. first, and then things about uh, people and the world around me, and uh, my immediate and not so immediate surroundings. Um, so after the birth of my children, uh, my life is on fast forward. 
So as I am approaching uh, the old age, I wanted to... It's still off on the horizon, Otto. I can <laughs> promise you. It's pretty far away. Is it? <laughs> I promise. I promise. <laughs> but it's the, it's, it's the truth. It's the <laughs> truth. Um, and I feel this is a part of my life that I feel very, very strong, mm -hmm. uh, very happy. Um, I set my goals and I go for it. I work hard. Um, and uh, I'm afraid of old age and I'm afraid of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm afraid of being an old vulnerable woman mm -hmm. in a place, mm -hmm. uh, in an area of this world that is um, troubled. Mm -hmm. So this is how these women came to be. Mm -hmm. There's such an intimacy in the stories that you tell, and you have this sort of inner monologue of those women, and you talk about their vulnerability, but there's also a great deal of strength within each of the, each of the stories themselves. What do you want the readers to take away about understanding, if, if I can say this with respect to the huge diversity of women's experiences across Cyprus, about women of Cyprus? What do you want them to sort of take away from that, from that space? Uh, w women uh, are um, appear to be vulnerable, mm. but they are not. Mm. Um, they appear to be silent, uh, but they have stories to tell. Mm. Uh, they play the most significant uh, role in mm -hmm. the family. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's what keeps the family together. Mm -hmm. And I mean, not only the nuclear family, mm -hmm. but the family around it. Uh, those of us with Cypriot or Greek background know what I'm talking about. Um, so these stories um, gave these women who had to deal with absurd uh, situations mm -hmm. in their life the opportunity to resort to extreme action. Mm -hmm. And this is where fiction mm -hmm. helps mm -hmm. because fiction manages to flirt with the fantastical, mm -hmm. uh, bring it together with the real, and sometimes the surreal. And uh, if the writer does her work um, well and uh, the reader enters that fantastical world mm -hmm. and accepts it as mm -hmm. her reality, mm -hmm. then you get to coexist mm -hmm. with these women. Even, even you can get to see reflections of yourself mm -hmm. in these women. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about this sort of the surrealist quality of, I mean, obviously of, of deserted, but also I found that in, in the final story as well, the sort yes. of the situation in which this, this young woman, this young woman is placed. And I think, is it, um, is it difficult to write in that way where you are bringing people into something where you're asking them to suspend reality in such a short space of time. How do you create that kind of intimacy with your readers to get them into those places of surrealism? I, I studied in the US. I did my master's in creative writing. Um, and I remember Stanley Colbert, one of my teachers, he used to be a producer. I think he also worked here in Canada. Um, he used to be a film, film producer, a director, and writer. He always said to us, you can do whatever you want, mm. as long as you get away with it. Mm. <laughs> do it with confidence. Yeah. And people yeah. will come yeah. along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot, and uh, colleagues here, I'm sure um, many of you work on issues of, of migration and, um, and displacement and that, and thinking about Anna in Deserted and her decision to stay. And when I was reading that story, I was thinking a lot about Ukraine. And I was thinking a lot about decisions that people are making tonight about staying or going in those, in those spaces. And that idea of, um, of what does it actually mean to lose place and the importance of place. And so I know you and I talked a bit about this yesterday, but I wanted 
you to just talk a little bit on why you centered Anna, where you centered her, and the decision that she made to stay in this deserted city. Place. I think that place in these uh, short stories is also a, a character, mm. uh, the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. Um, it's again me trying to negotiate with an absurd uh, reality. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we are going to the beach and uh, we take the boat out in the water and uh, to the east we see Famagusta, the tall buildings and the hotels that um, used to be a vibrant city mm -hmm. um, which welcomed bands like the ABBA and um, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Brigitte Bardot, mm -hmm. Raquel Welsh. Um, that's in the 60s and the 70s. It's now a ghost town. Mm -hmm. Nature has taken over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story started with uh, what if? What if this woman decided mm -hmm. to, to stay there? Mm -hmm. What would happen? Mm. How would she interact mm. with her place? Mm. Mm. Um, in the end, the place is her, mm. and she is place. Mm. Um, place, idiosyncrasy, character, personality, they are interconnected. Mm -hmm. If you take place out of the equation, you're missing something very, very important. Mm. And by place, it could be the place where you were born. Mm -hmm. It could be a place you visited or a place you've lived a part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, we connect with place mm -hmm. and it becomes part of us. I think the surrealism that you describe also with places like Farmagusta and we were talking yesterday about other spaces like that that we would think about that have been taken back by nature because they have been deserted. And you think about the photographs of Chernobyl, you think about the DMZ between Korea and South Korea, and so forth. And so the idea of this place that's almost stuck in time, which she is as well in a strange way as yeah. she's living through memory and, and the power of memory. And it, it led me to another theme that I was interested in you exploring a bit, which was isolation. And all of these stories are deeply intimate because you're in the inner monologue of these women. Um, and so in a way, you, you have the, the luxury of, of hearing their own thoughts rather than having to hear a sort of something, them telling this to anyone else. You're inside them in this space. But there's something quite isolating about each of their experiences. Being, when I think of the, the final story, this young girl not being allowed to be a girl and having to observe the rituals of young people at a distance and that question of isolation and obviously Anna in this. And it did lead, lead me to reflect on the isolation of conflict, but also the divided nature of Cyprus itself. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could just reflect on what that means to you in these stories and, and for people in Cyprus to think about. The conflict, um, the divide, mm -hmm. uh, it's, Another thing which is uh, surreal in, in our uh, everyday lives, mm. um, as you know, Nicosia is divided. There is the buffer zone uh, running across it, the no man's land, um, taken over by nature, as you mm. said. Um, animals can fly over it, can walk through it, mm -hmm. but people cannot go there. Mm. Even if they see their houses and their shops there, they cannot. Uh, they are not allowed. So inevitably, this will uh, have an impact on everyone. Uh, I belong to a generation of uh, writers that um, we were born after the war, mm -hmm. so we haven't experienced the world, the war uh, itself and the conflict. Uh, but I think that we carry this uh, inherited uh, mm -hmm. trauma mm -hmm. uh, from uh, borrowed memories mm -hmm. and from the stories we've heard. At the same time, we live in a troubled country, wounded country. Mm. Um, it's difficult to find mm. a, war, a mm. word 
uh, to characterize the situation in Cyprus. Um, right next to the, to the buffer zone, um, it's, it's very difficult to come in terms with it. Uh, either you try to negotiate it, uh, you try to reason mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. uh, or you just make it part of your everyday routine and you forget about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So yes, the division does have an impact on uh, writers and the people of Cyprus, and uh, also it has an impact uh, on our characters mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm and on how we understand our history. And I think this is where fiction, as you were saying, is so fascinating because you can tell stories that aren't about a specific fact or moment, but can be about more about the human experience. Yes, yes, you, you focus your lens on the individual story. Uh, you want to tell that, that unique story of that one person. Mm -hmm. You want to tell someone's peripetia in um, mm -hmm. Aristotelian, uh, sense, uh, because um, this way, when the we, when the collective becomes individual, uh, it's easier for someone who reads the story to identify and mm -hmm. understand, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where we find our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I think you put it wonderfully yesterday when you said that literature speaks to the heart mm, very uh, much so. and uh, I hope that my work yeah. speaks to the heart it really does and I think it becomes a very personal experience reading each of these pieces I think everybody takes it very very close to the heart I have um, one more question I'm conscious that I'm not allowed to completely monopolize the conversation and there'll be lots of um, time for for um, discussion but you know I was thinking um, I was really really struck about um, Susanna and this young foreign prostitute and this sort of view of um, the the disapproval of what she was doing and who she was and that and I thought it was an interesting um, reminder as well when we often think about women in conflict we think about them as victims and we think about them as peacemakers and we think about them in roles that have a natural positivity to them that oh you know it's they're in, innately good in those spaces and what you saw there was also prejudice coming out between the two and the sort of idea of judgment and, and so forth. But then it, you get to some sort of redemption at the end of that. And I was just wondering if you could reflect a bit on sort of the ability of drawing out the complexity of each of these characters in such a short space of time that they're not just one thing as you tell in that particular story. Oh my gosh, Susanna. Susanna was not her real name. They mm -hmm. just told her that mm -hmm. it suited her better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, tells it all about mm -hmm. the story. This mm -hmm. is a woman who's been denied of her name, mm -hmm. her identity. Mm -hmm. um, her, her clients talk about the heroes of, uh, of their country and ask her mm -hmm. uh, if there are heroes in her country. And when she starts telling them her stories, they don't even listen. Mm -hmm. So she has a voice, but nobody will uh, listen to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, these little details uh, in the story portray um, who she is, what she is denied mm -hmm. uh, in her life. But in the end, we see acceptance from mm -hmm. uh, the very strict and um, Britannical uh, Rodula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a lovely little twist at the end. All of them have lovely twists at the end. I think. Um, I am going to uh, stop monopolizing um, Aratu's time and and open uh, the floor for um, for some questions. I think we have about half an hour. Would you, if I'm right? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Okay, that's what I've been told. My boss. By the way, Khalil didn't tell you that um, the other reason that I always jump when he says um, come is he is also my boss. <laughs> as the secretary of the board of the Global Center for Pluralism, so naturally. Um, so if there are questions, if people want to raise their hands, I think there's some microphones that can be moved around. I think we have a question around this side. Were you raising your hand? Oh, you were just waving at your friends. Oh, you're so funny. Okay, sorry, Mahmoud, I have a question in the front here. 
microphone for the colleagues online to make sure that we have, yeah. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for the book, but I was curious to know what was the inspiration for the title? Mm. Ah. I always leave the title uh, for last, be it uh, the title of a short story or the title of, of the book. And um, uh, this is uh, a phrase from the short story, Deserted, uh, when Anna's pills um, run out, she goes to the pharmacy of uh, the deserted uh, city looking for her um, medication for her heart. Uh, and uh, she's looking for her medication everywhere, um, in the fridge, in the cupboards, but it's not there. It's not behind the dossiers. It's not inside the cabinet. It's not in the ornamental teapot. And uh, this knot is her desperation and futility because she has chosen to stay but she's staying in a deserted city. And in the end, I don't have to reveal the end to her. No, <laughs> you all have to read it. Any questions? Thanks. You're all very quiet. Um, would you, you'll let me know if we have any questions from our online colleagues. I'm curious to know if our colleague on the Solomon Islands is still awake. I think it's the middle of the night over there, so I'm very impressed with, with that. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful, and I think we're all really glad to be here at the book club. And you know, one of, one of the questions I, I would like be thinking about was, how has this been received within the, mm -hmm. the Cypriot um, community? You translated it back to Greek from English. I imagine there's a population that speaks both, but I'm just wondering about how it was received and how the two um, versions, the English and, and the Greek, have sparked different kinds of responses. A great question. Oh. I don't think that they have uh, triggered different kind of responses. Um, actually, uh, people, when, when they read either of the two, they want to if they read English, for example, they want to read the Greek version. And if they read the Greek version, they want to read the English version. Um, in Cyprus, we hope that we have a good command of English. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's like a, a second language there. Um, I, w I, I was humbled um, by the fact that uh, the collection was very well uh, received. Um, there were uh, several presentations and critiques in the local press, uh, both from Greek-speaking and um, English-speaking uh, papers. And, uh, but uh, the best thing, I think, for uh, a writer, at least for me, is to receive a message on social media by a person you don't know uh, who says, uh, I read your book and I loved it. Thank you so much. So that's, that's the best mm. for me. Mm. Mm. Hi, Kalispera. Kalispera. Um, I, I'm gonna build off the previous question. I had something similar in mind, but I'm curious also, uh, it's almost 50 years later uh, many people in 1974, many Cypriots came to Canada. Uh, some went back, some have gone back and forth. And so I'm wondering what kind of conversations are happening now um, and how, how much is this still, the sentiment coming out in these stories still present today? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think um, the stories can uh, still speak to us today um, I hope that there is um, a universal quality to them and um, that the reader will care about 
the women and their stories that resulted from the historical event. But um, of course, this is not a historical text. Um, is taking history with a capital H as a point of departure mm -hmm. and focuses on the history with a lowercase h of the individual. And uh, my hope and aspiration and my wish is that if uh, someone reads this, um, someone who has a totally different background, knows nothing about Cyprus, um, doesn't even know where Cyprus is, and uh, he or she is touched by the stories, then that will be my um, fulfillment. Um, as, as for the historical uh, fact and the conflict and the war, yes, they are still present uh, in our lives today. And as I said uh, earlier, we see today that even the youngest, uh, the, the new generation of uh, writers still um, try to come in terms with what's going on in our country. And uh, we try to come in terms through our writing. So we are negotiating a trauma that we've inherited because mm -hmm. we haven't experienced mm -hmm. uh, the war. Uh, of course, we do experience its results. Um, but yeah, I hope I'm answering your question. I think you, sp you write so beautifully about that sort of inherited trauma and memory. Also in the first story with a woman whose, my husband has not died, he's run off with a film star and gone to live in the United States. And all of that, but I think often that inherited trauma is harder to surface to enable people to deal with it. And I think that fiction can play a really beautiful role in allowing people to come to terms with historical pieces that doesn't have to be about arguing over the facts, but about connecting back to the human experience and then, and therefore the human impact of, of what's happened. I think you do yes. that really beautifully. Yes. Other questions? A very quiet audience. Khalil, I knew you had a question. <laughs> So as you know, I've been haunted by Anna. I feel like she's here with us. We've talked about Anna so much. So just to recall, Anna uh, is uh, an elderly woman. Is she 80? Yes. Yeah, 80 who decided to stay as the rest of the city has deserted. I'm haunted by Anna because we are in the midst of a global migration crisis, a forced migration crisis. And this is actually a question for both of you. Mm. Can you reflect a little bit on what Anna needs or expects from the rest of humanity? What are it's a small question. What are our it's always you with the small questions, Khalil. What are our obligations to Anna? Does she need us to force her to leave for her own safety? Mm. Does she need us to come into that city and repopulate it? Does she need us just to leave her alone? Mm. What, what are we called to as humanity in relation to a situation where people are making the most difficult decision? to leave home mm. or not to leave home? Mm. Do we have a cheat sheet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Khalil, you and I did talk, um, so Arata and I talked a little bit about this wider question yesterday when we were talking. And I had recently listened to a podcast that was um, featuring a man whose job it was to go in and evacuate people from Ukraine. And he was being sent by families to go and get elderly relatives that felt a lot like Anna and say, it's time to go. And in one case, a woman said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking some soup. I'd like to finish the soup. We're going to take it with us. And these sorts of moments of absurdity and of, but, we need, uh, but I need the food because it's my culture and because it's my home. And in this particular story, he finally convinces her to leave the soup and go. And he gets her to safety and he finds out two weeks later that she's gone back. And he doesn't know what to do with that knowledge. And I think f the question that I, I was really left with with Anna was this power of choice of this idea of choosing to stay. I think that you, you place her as being really powerful by choosing to stay. Yeah. But at the same time, there's such deep tragedy in that. 
and you give her this beautiful release through these superpowers and memory and so forth. But there is, I think it's, the question is unanswerable in a way, Khalil, which is the point that the city is abandoned and people that stay are heroic, but they're also, but it's a folly because there's nothing there. And so what do we as humanity do? So as usual, you've asked, asked the unanswerable question. But I think you but probably think have something that, deeper. Use the mic so our, our colleagues in the Solomon Islands and elsewhere can hear. If I might just offer an observation. I mean, if it was me and I was 20, I might make a decision one way. Mm. If I'm 80 mm. and I've been associated with this mm. particular land, and I mm. say this from the perspective of people that we know mm. in Syria mm. and in Afghanistan who have lived and their families have lived there for generations and generations mm. and they're 80 and they're saying, look, if I'm going to die, I'm 80. I'm, I'm going to die here. I'm going to die here. And, but if I was 20, I might make a different decision. Mm. So I think, I think the context, which is partly what you frame in your books, will de define some of those decisions. Mm. And they are individual, I think, uh, to go to Khalil's point. You see, I don't think there is necessarily a common response mm. from humanity, because I think you're going to create your own, your own dynamic of mm. where you are mm. at that particular mm. mo moment in time. And that'll frame what your decision is going to be, mm. irrespective of what everybody else is mm. doing around mm. you. Um, so that was just a, yeah. uh, an observation. I think what Khalil is asking or pointing out very cleverly is why leave? Why have to leave your, pl your place in the first place? Why force people out of their homes? I think this is what you're trying to, to tell us and what is our responsibility as a global society towards these nations that are in conflict or mm. suffer. And is it asking, is it admitting defeat to simply abandon a city to nature and to the animals going back and to retreat rather than to stay? But is it defeat or is it uh, the beginning of a new struggle? Mm. But these are the elemental questions of co that conflict forces upon you, right? Which are the, the questions that you manage to raise in very few words, which is sort of extraordinary. And of course, literature will never provide um, the answers. Mm. Nobody can provide the answers. Mm. Um, writers do not seek to train or educate. Mm. They are trying to explore the human condition. And mm. maybe if we start asking the right questions, mm. there's a better future for our world. And I think that what you do is you provoke that thought and that discussion, and you do that really beautifully. Thank you, Meredith. <laughs> it's true. I think um, just maybe in, in closing, and you may want to say a word or two as we, as we sort of wrap up. I think I keep this because I don't wear a watch, so my apologies. I'm not checking my text messages or anything. I'm just trying to keep to time. <laughs> Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that I think is so powerful about this is too often when we talk about history, we punctuate it about wars and the, you know, we all learn our history here. We learn about Eep and we learn about the Psalm and we learn about specific conflict moments, but we don't learn about the moments in between. And that if we punctuated our understanding of history about these moments in between, maybe we would understand history differently and maybe we would take our forward decisions differently. And so I think what you do just so beautifully is provoke us to think about this history. And like you say, it isn't a histor a work of history, but it takes history as a starting point. But it gives us a different way of entering history in that, in that space. And I think that's really profound. So thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. Right. And thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Stop applauding. We have a question online. <laughs> Nobody get up. You're not allowed to go yet. Uju, do you have a question? <laughs> uh, yes, I was just reading some of the questions that have come in online. Um, just first off, I think our colleague from the Solomon Island is letting you know that it is morning. Okay, good. Uh, Thank you. Where they are at. <laughs> um, 
And from that same colleague, the question is, I think, specifically to Erato, uh, do you see any difference of emotions and feelings while narrating the stories of women of different ages and places? Mm. Mm. It's a lovely question. It's a very interesting question, friend from the Solomon Islands. Um, I think uh, the older you get, um, uh, emotions are heightened. I mean, they grow bigger and uh, worry grows bigger and uh, fear and all, all sentiments and emotions. So yes, uh, if you are writing a young woman or a young man, of course it will be much different from uh, writing an older person. And uh, yes, place does matter if you are writing a character. We said earlier that place is part of the character, so it does affect him or her. Mm -hmm. Were there other questions from the Yes, there are. Right, go. Um, another question that we have here is, the person is asking, how could we find inspirations for write-ups? Does it have to be always based on true stories or can we just use the journey of our wide imaginations? No. Mm. Oh. I think uh, I think inspiration is uh, everywhere. As long as you don't wait for it to come, you have to pursue it like uh, you would pursue a lover. Um, a writer has to have a keen eye for for detail. Mm. I think that everyone has uh, a story to tell. We are all stories. We are made uh, with stories and the story is, going to, is what we are going to leave behind when we leave this world. Um, so pay attention to detail. Um, write with passion and um, edit mercilessly. <laughs> <laughs> you were also saying yesterday that you're working on another short story, which I won't um, out the, the theme if you don't want it to be known, um, but that it was something you haven't necessarily experienced, but you were using your own experiences as a mother yes. and your own uh, sort of imagining of what that, those choices would be in order to build a story, it doesn't have to be that you experienced a particular thing, but that you use that in inner inner yeah. life. Yes, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, we'll have to repeat what uh, I said to you yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it. Th my stories start with my innermost fears and worries and how I try to negotiate with them. So, I I project. And um, I, I think of my, of my children and the new perspective that they give me uh, to, to view the world. And um, I see the world around us, how terrifying has become. And um, yes, yeah, sometimes I think, oh my God, what if this thing happened to my child? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we, are, uh, we are so blessed uh, to have our uh, families and our health. Uh, but we, we can, uh, we can um, explore situations such as uh, this one. Um, I guess a writer is a more sensitive uh, human being, a more uh, empathetic mm -hmm. uh, human being. Um, but my, my mentor, Panos Ioannidis, once said to me that um, a writer is just uh, an intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for a writer to feel the vibrations of of the world mm. around her, around him, and uh, the story will just come through mm. him or her. That's beautiful. 
Any others before we go? Go. Okay. Um, another question, and I think I can take two at a time um, because more are coming in. Um, so a question that we have here is asking, so it starts off by saying, since how we construct our stories impacts our thinking, what values would you want, I'm guessing I'm adding the readers, to, be, to take through the deconstruction and narration of this short story? Which values? What values, or what, I'm assuming what mindsets, what, what would be the, t the key takeaway that you hope readers can take from your work? Huh. Um, I, I said it before um, that uh, um, I'm not the smartest person in the world and I don't have all the answers and I'm not a philosopher nor um, a theoretician but uh, I'm, I'm a writer and plain and simple a uh, writer is a storyteller so the, ta the task at hand is to tell story and uh, hope that the person who is going to read the story is going to see glimpses of herself or himself mm -hmm. in the characters and uh, find consolation and maybe feel less alone. Mm. I love that. Okay, and I'll just share the last two questions. Um, the first one says, states, you mentioned that these stories were written at different times. What inspired you to write the stories at those different times? <laughs> and then I would just add on the second question. How do you define courage? To leave as courageous or to stay in a comfort zone? Globalization is pushing people into cities and overcrowded urban jungles? Is change not the only thing that is constant? So choice of change is a human right. Mm. Maybe that's a food for thought more than a question, um, but I can leave it uh, open to, for your response. That last one wasn't a question. It was a list of questions. <laughs> it's a list of questions. <laughs> well, what inspired the stories? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Okay, um, the, ver the first story was uh, inspired by uh, an actual fact. Um, my husband's grandfather was a missing person. Mm. And uh, when his remains were identified uh, decades after his death, we went to the funeral. I remember I was uh, pregnant with my first child and uh, Decades after his death, the mm. mourning and the, the loss mm. and the hurt was there as if he had died the day before. Mm. And uh, that's how this uh, story was, uh, was born. should be able to remember these things, but I don't. Deserted is the second one. Mm, I don't know. Deserted, I was, um, this will sound odd. I was in uh, Switzerland for work. And um, usually when I travel, alone, I get to have my alone time and time to think and write. So I sat by the river and there was this beautiful old woman who was uh, bathing in the river. And um, I started writing of the sensations she must mm. uh, felt at that time. And uh, the first thing that I wrote from the story was Anna in the seawater. Wow. Uh, I of the, uh, uh, you have to, for, to forgive me, I don't remember what, 
what was the inspiration for Jesus and the, and the Apostles. That was uh, written a very, very long time ago. Eye of the Goat. Yes, I have seen a rooster running through the yard, headless. Mm. It's amazing that small things can birth a wider story, that you can construct it around yeah. imagery. And I think the power of imagery in these, yes. in these spaces is, is amazing. We good? Great. Um, a huge thank you to those of you online who've been with us. A huge thank you to everyone here. Um, Aranto, I have a small gift that I just wanted to give you to say thank you from us here. Um, so you can open it afterwards, but I just will tell everybody what it is for their purposes. So it's a kokum scarf, which some of you might know what a kokum scarf is. So a kokum scarf are traditionally worn by grandmothers. So this is for you way in the future, my dear. <laughs> but you can wear them now as well, and it won't make you look old, I promise you that. But um, they are worn by um, in indigenous women in Canada, Inuit, First Nations, and Métis, but um, primarily First Nations and Métis. Um, they're uh, traditionally often Cree, but they actually came through a really wonderful intercultural story because Ukrainian um, immigrants that came to Canada wore babushkas, and the babushka sort of found its way into um, First Nations culture through the sharing of community and the sharing of spaces. So it's really about women and about sharing of community in conflict. So it's for you. Um, a warm round of applause again to our, our speakers, and you can take your seats. Uh, thank you so much for, yeah. for, for joining us and for engaging all of us in such a lively and enriching conversation this evening. We're so pleased to have everyone participate in today's discussion, and we would like to give this opportunity to you to give us your feedback about how today's session uh, went. If you have any specific comments, any recommendations, things that you liked, things that you didn't like. Um, in a second, we should have um, a survey uh, code that will come up on your screen and also to those who are joining us online uh, Please we invite you to scan the code or to use the link that will be put in the chat So just give us your feedback about today's session any recommendations any books that are uh, on your mind that you would love to see us host here as part of Global Reads. Um, also, any feedback that you have for our speakers, we can do our best to um, pass those messages along to them as well. Now, to wrap up today's session, um, the Aga Khan Foundation Canada is very pleased to have worked with the High Commission of Cyprus here in Canada to be able to host and bring together and bring to life this event. So to give us some closing remarks, I would like us to please welcome His Excellency, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Cyprus to Canada. So after all this, what we heard, what we experienced, uh, I'm almost speechless. So I will be, I'll try to be brief, very brief. And I'll just, before I start with the thank you and everything, I'll start with a message that I received just now from Cyprus. I didn't know that someone, like 2.30 in the morning, I don't know what time is in Cyprus now, 2.30, 3 in the morning, someone is watching us. <laughs> so, and this guy, it's a guy, he wrote to me. He's very critical of Cyprus, you know, the typical, you know, young people critical, we are doing everything bad and wrong. And, one of the few moments I am proud to be a Cypriot. Great initiative and bravo to her. So. <laughs> this is a message just received, you know, from home. So uh, indeed, I feel blessed uh, to be here with you, to have worked uh, with the Aga Foundation, with Herado, with Meredith. I will not go into the book. We have heard a lot about uh, the work 
the inspiring work of Herado. Uh, I'm not going to read what I had, you know, intended, but just to give you the genesis of this initiative. So basically, sometime in January, Herado cons contacted me, I don't know, mid-January, late January, and saying, you know, I'm a writer, I'm Cypriot, uh, my husband is coming for a meeting in Canada, and I would like to have the opportunity to present my work in Canada if that is possible. I wasn't negative, I wasn't positive. You know, I initially said, having, I just came here, like I received this message in January, and it's like three months before I arrived. Uh, I arrived here in Canada three months, in 1st of October, somewhere there I arrived in Canada. So I said, we sat down with the colleagues in Cyprus and here, and we, we wrote down a three-year plan how to raise the profile of Cyprus in Canada. Uh, so Erado and her suggestion came handy. And so I said, okay, let's pursue this. And at one of the receptions, I met uh, Dr. Ivo, who is the representative of the uh, Aga Khan uh, Foundation. I don't know the name, the correct name is Maili Imamet uh, here. And a story that is not known in Cyprus, really not known, is that Prince Sadruddin Aga Khan, who was in the 60s and 70s the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, following the invasion of 74, was appointed by the UN Secretary General at the time as uh, his special envoy to Cyprus on the humanitarian situation that was unfolding following the invasion. So immediately uh, when I met uh, Dr. Ibo, I said, you know, we have a shared history together, so let's see how we can, we, we can work together. And then I met Meredith in late January, and we, I just raised this idea, I just, you know, a rato, a writer, I don't know her, I don't know of her, I haven't read her work, but, you know, uh, I'm going to Cyprus in February. I will, you know, try to meet her. And why don't we have this uh, initiative? And, you know, one thing led to the next. And here we are today uh, and feeling honored among colleagues. Thank you very much for coming. You know, with the Aga Khan Foundation, with the Global Center of Fulleries, with all of you, and sharing our uh, thoughts and ideas of this uh, great work. And thank you for making this a reality, Rato and Meredith and Dr. Ibo and each and every one of you, thank you for making this uh, a reality. And uh, when I was reading the book, I read the book in Greek, of course. <laughs> uh, I read the book in Greek and I read part of it in English. I haven't finished it, even though it's like when I, I read it in Greek, I was so overwhelmed and finished it. I didn't want it to finish. And it resonated so much. You know, I'm a Cypriot. I lived, you know, all my life in Cyprus. And the themes, like missing persons, something tiny. I was, again, lucky in Cyprus. I worked in about 2002 and 2003, around that time, with the missing persons and both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. And I was working there and I was reading the short story and everything in my mind went back to, you know, 2002, 2003, uh, and the initiatives that we took as part of the, uh, I was working at, with the government at that time as well, uh, the initiatives that we took in order to have uh, excavations and DNAs and everything in, uh, in the government controlled area of Turkish Cypriot missing person at that time, because you said the program correctly started in 2006, the cooperation with the Committee on Missing Persons in Cyprus. But we wanted as a government to do something about the issue well before. 
At that time, the other side was not cooperating. And we said, let's take unilateral measures and let's call the Turkish Cypriot because we started, when I was involved, it was a, you know, excavation with, you know, Turkish Cypriot remains. So we said, let's call the relatives, put ads in Turkish Cypriot newspapers. Imagine the government of Cyprus putting ads in Turkish Cypriot newspapers. It was like groundbreaking work at the time, really. So, and not without criticism. But so we did that and then Turkish Cypriots came, despite what their leadership was saying at the time, they came, they gave the DNA and all that. And slowly, slowly, because of the pressure by the people, the program started working because people wanted answers. So uh, then every, uh, I'm not gonna go you know, in historical perspective and everything, but every story, every short story that Erado wrote, every short story I read, uh, woke up something in me, resonated with my uh, with my life, they, you know, in Famagusta, I used to work at the ministry and working on uh, confidence building measures, it was around 2006, 2005, about Famagusta and how we could uh, take initiatives, uh, I think with the EU at the time, it was the Luxembourg was the presidency, trying to see, take initiatives and to reinvigorate a stalled situation in around 2006 with Famagusta. And then uh, in all of the stories, gender is of paramount, the gender dimension is of paramount importance in all of the stories. And again, I say how lucky I was that from 2019 to January 21, I was working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Cyprus at the time, and I was working with the advisor of the foreign minister on gender mainstream in foreign policy. And I was the only guy in the team. So it was only women. So I was, uh, you know, chosen at that time to be, you know, the only guy at the team. And I was trying to bring change in basically in diplomacy, which in Cyprus was more of a male dominated field in order to make it more equal, if you so wish. So. Uh, we achieved a lot of that and anyway. So today we have just a parenthesis. Today we have, you know, the permanent representative UN in Geneva is a female colleague. The permanent representative uh, in Brussels is a female colleague. The permanent representative of the OSC and many ambassadors in Germany, etc. So we changed. We did things in order to, uh, you know, have uh, increased the voice uh, and the role of women uh, in diplomacy and uh, within the foreign ministry. So. The book resonated so much with me in that after meeting Erado in February and after, uh, you know, trying to read different stuff, and I see that there are a new generation of women writers in Cyprus that want to bring change, and they give me, and not only me, I, I, I think they speak to, uh, the hearts and minds of many Cypriots that a better future is possible. And this is the message that I got here today. I got from the book, I get from the discussion, and I, you know, I get from uh, the work that we do. You know, it's these small parts that make you feel that uh, you are doing something which is uh, positive and a small step of change, positive change, which I just want to thank everyone that made this a reality, especially my colleagues at work, uh, Dimitra, Maria, who you know, bear with me every day because we're extremely small uh, delegation and imagining you know, wanting to raise the profile of Cyprus in Canada uh, with so few people, <laughs> it's not an easy job. So thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for making this a reality. Thank you, Rado. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.